Okay, so welcome everybody. Today's webinar with Chris. Chris, can you introduce yourself and feel free to start your presentation? Sure. My name is Chris Luber. I'm the Executive Director at the Water and Wastewater Authority of Wilson County, uh, located in, in Tennessee, and uh, been here for probably about, I guess, 13 years or so. Prior to that, was in the consultancy business, you know, working with, with water loss control. So I'm um, looking forward to uh, providing uh, this presentation on, on our utility, and um, I'll go ahead and proceed. So we're located in Tennessee, the middle of the state. And as you can see from the map on the, the left-hand side, we're in the, the eastern half of, of the United States. Um, Chris, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Julian, do you see the presentation? Because I'm just seeing Chris right now. Yeah, I can see the presentation, Lady. Okay, well, that's fine. Okay. So we're considered a large utility um, by the EPA, but, but in comparison to other utilities are relatively, relatively small. It's close to 50,000 utilities in, in the United States. And uh, if you eliminate the very small utilities, we kind of fall in that size of, of, of the mid range where half the utilities are larger than us and, and the other half are smaller than us. So just to give you uh, an overview of my presentation, I'm gonna talk, uh, provide some background information on our utility, talk about our system-wide approach to uh, district metered areas, DMAs, um, the technology we use to measure flow and pressure, um, and then I'm gonna kind of work through some scenarios, um, how DMAs help you identify areas for emergency main breaks, and then go into the, the analytical side of uh, the minimum night flow uh, analysis and step testing and share with you a number of different scenarios uh, we've run across with this methodology and then provide um, the financial payback that, that we've calculated on our program. So I'm going to try to take you out in the field um, as best I can and uh, share a lot of field data, real data that, that we use on a daily basis and the results of uh, work we've been doing here. So we purchase 100% of our water um, from four different suppliers. So our water is extremely valuable. We've got 345 miles of uh, distribution main, primarily smaller diameter mains, mostly that six to eight inch uh, range. And we're pretty much 100% PVC. So leakage, sonic acoustic leak detection is, is difficult for us. We have about 7,600 uh, service connections. And our program really started back in the early 90s. The um, State of Tennessee Energy Division had funded an energy program to reduce energy, energy consumption by reducing leakage and distribution systems in Tennessee. So they funded a program to do um, around 250 or so, um, near 300 and some utilities. And we were the first participant in that program. So out of that program, our, our field personnel learned to do acoustic leak detection surveys. I came on board at the authority in 2006 and having knowledge about how difficult it is to um, hear, audibly hear leaks on PVC pipe, um, I decided to move ahead and set up a more robust program to identify leakage in smaller sectors within the, the uh, system and then be able to prioritize our leak detection efforts. So we don't waste time looking for leaks where there are no leaks or very minimal amounts of leakage. So, and then be able to establish an ongoing type monitoring program. So for our district metered areas, uh, we already have 15 system input meters where we purchase water from our four different suppliers. All those input meters are tagged to customer consumption. So if I want, I could actually do 15 IWA, AWWA water audits within our distribution system if I so desired. And I have done that in the past and that, that yields some good information. We have five ground storage tanks. So we establish our DMAs based on the input meters, storage tanks, pump stations, 
got some PRVs, et cetera, out in the system. And now we have uh, 25 permanent DMAs. Uh, so we cover 100% of our distribution system with DMAs. So the first thing we did uh, a number of years ago was took a look at the SCADA data and realized, well, a simple way to measure flows in a DMA is to do a drop test off your storage tanks. Um, so we got with our SCADA provider. They did some basic reprogramming a couple hours of time. And now our tank level changes are converted into gallons per minute flow for minimum night flow measurements automatically. Then the next factor is, well, okay, so we have night flow information, but we also have customer consumption in there. So what do we, how do we calculate customer consumption? We still manually read meters. We focus on technology on the infrastructure. And now going forward, we will look at uh, implementation of a AMI system. But in the meantime, we have to have a calculation for minimum night flow in reference to the legitimate nighttime consumption. So we use a calculation of 1.5 gallons per connection per hour. And that was based on literature reviews a number of years ago for end user study from the Water Research Foundation uh, projects. And that calculation works well for us. It's, that's basically a three gallon commode flush in that two hour period of time. And we have a number, number of other utilities that are also using that as a calculation. So then a very basic formula is the minimum night flow less the legitimate nighttime consumption is leakage. And if you got an AMR or AMI system, of course, you can get very detailed information on your legitimate nighttime consumption. So on the left is, is a map of our, our DMAs. That's a few years old now, but as you can see, they're all different shapes and sizes. You know, we don't set a DMA on some strict criteria. We kind of look at natural boundaries and natural places to grab information that seem to make sense. On the right-hand side is, is just a screenshot of our Trizel Ferry tank, which can feed the Trizel Ferry DMA. And if you look to the lower right-hand side, you can see those very basic calculations of the change in the tank level over a period of time converted into gallons per minute. So for example, here we have the minimum night flow is 99 gallons a minute. Then on the right-hand side, as we advanced over the years, we installed permanent type flow metering out there. So in the upper right-hand side, you can see a flow meter, basically with the output. And uh, we use using the ultrasonic type flow meters of 4 to 20 out that ties in the SCADA. So you've got two measurements there of, of actual flows during that minimum night flow period. Very simple thing to do. So some of the technology we use, um, we started in the upper left with uh, the portable strap-on ultrasonic flow meters. And as you can see, um, there's uh, a, set, a bar with two transducers. It basically sends an ultrasonic signal from transducer A to the back of the pipe, back to transducer B and vice versa. When there's no flow in that pipe, that time difference from A to B to B to A is zero. When you introduce flow, it causes a shift in that time, and that shift in time is related to the velocity in the pipe. So then you have, you know, the pipe diameter you can calculate out, the, the flow meter calculates out the rate of flow in gallons per minute. So when we're doing minimum night flow measurements with step testing, we're data logging at 30 second intervals. And there's your flow data off that, that actual um, flow from that tank a few nights later where it increased up to nearly 120 gallons per minute. Then we went ahead and advanced to permanent type installations. Again, the ultrasonic type technology. And what I advise here is that if when you go to permanent installations, be sure you, you always have a visual display. Don't always rely on technology be able to drive up in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning when it's five degrees outside and look at the visual display. That's good, good information in case your technology goes down for communications. And of course, data coming back on SCADA, that's what your SCADA data looks like. SCADA, we may hit it every 15 minutes on normal intervals, but then we can pull it kind of almost continuously if, if we so desire during the step testing procedure, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
Then we went ahead and advanced our technology. Like I mentioned before, you know, we got 50,000, nearly 50,000 water utilities in, in the United States. Many utilities are a lot smaller than us, and many of them only have one operator, one certified operator that's trying to operate and manage that system. So we wanted to figure out a way to, to of course, help us, but help other utilities. So we developed a process called one-man step testing. And a number of years back, it's 2014, we actually got it implemented. We spent about two years talking to meter manufacturers about how to retrofit a meter to get good flow information. And they all, all would come back and they'd say, well, we can give you one pulse per 100 gallons of flow. And I'm like, we, we can't do that. I, I need to see gallon per minute flow. So we identified a meter, this one's manufactured by um, Elster and Evo Q4, which would give us one pulse per one gallon of flow off that meter and also has a visual display again and a rate of flow in gallons per minute. You always want that visual display out there. And then on the right side, our black box or SCADA box basically calculates that rate of flow. Um, these are all solar powered sites, no power, electrical main power required. And if you're gonna monitor flow, you might as well go ahead and put a pressure transducer in and also monitor pressure. The meter's battery powered. So these sites then report back um, to our SCADA system. But what's interesting is they report back through text messaging through the Verizon network. So when we're out actually step testing, isolating valves, we can bypass SCADA and actually take a smartphone and hit the site direct and text the site and get instantaneous flow data. So if our SCADA system went down, we can still communicate directly with the metering device when we're doing our step testing. So that kind of gave you an overview of some of the technology we use. Now, as you implement this technology, you start to see things in the, in the system. And this was a, an example where we had an emergency main break, 1,300 gallons per minute. And as we pulled in our SCADA tags from our trisil ferry tank, for example, here the blue one is a flow rate. And you can see our flow rate jump straight up. Obviously a main break, you get alarms for that. And then you can look and you see an input meter that feeds that DMA prior to a pump station. That flow rate also increased, kind of giving an indicator the brake might be in that direction. And then also you see a pressure drop on that pump station. But a key thing here was a neighboring DMA. This is our little bluebird DMA that normally not much flow, very small DMA, has a check valve. It's a lower pressure DMA, but that check valve op opened up and was feeding 200 gallons a minute. So right out of the gate, when I pulled these tags together during this emergency event, we were able to say, hey, the main break is in that area of the DMA. So we were able to dispatch crews out and we found that break within an hour, had it under control, and no customers even knew they were out of water during that period of time. So what's really interesting is you collect data and you correlate different things. It helps you identify in an emergency situation where the event is actually occurring before the customers even become aware of the scenario. Okay, so let's move down the path and start looking at some of the, the analytical side of it in reference to minimum night flow measurements. And you know, I, I try to really work at trying to keep things simple as best as I can as, as an operator out here. Well, the, in Tennessee, we're required to report regulatory wise with the um, IWA, AWWA, free water audit software. And we report on an annualized basis. So that's our foundational tool that, that I use and many other utilities use to help establish our target setting for, for DMAs. So, the first thing is uh, and on the, the top of the audit there, you see the arrow with the unavoidable annual real loss. And this is that technical minimum that's established in reference to you know, how low you can go technically using the best available uh, technology to reduce real losses. So for our utility system-wide back in 2009, it was around 61 million gallons per year. The second one we use is the, the real losses per length of mains per day. Now, we're a smaller utility, 
So this number here is calculated if you have a con connection density of 32 services or less, versus if you have 32 or more, um, you would be using basically a performance indicator based on number of connections per day, which going forward to the new version of uh, the AWWA free water audit software will also calculate this and we may look at converting to this uh, performance indicator when that when that occurs. And then we have the IOI, which is that ratio of the, the current annual real losses from the water audit divided by the unavoidable annual real loss, that ratio. And back then we we're 1.24. So we're relatively low already, but we've been doing DMAs for a number of years uh, prior to 2009. So they're the key components that we use to, to figure out our, our, our target setting for our DMAs. So a couple things here, when you, when you look at, well, where do you set your target? Um, number one, we have the technical expertise in-house, so we don't have to reach out to hire consultants. Um, I brought that experience on in reference to the work in the consultancy side, and our guys you know, knew how to do straightforward acoustic leak detection. The other main driver here is our cost of water supply. So now today, it's up to $3.06 per 1,000 gallons. So um, our water, again, like I mentioned earlier, is very valuable. So we actually set the target to try to reach and maintain the IOI of one or below if possible. Now, I will tell you that you should not set your target to reach an IOI of one without doing uh, an economic analysis, okay? Because it, for many utilities, that's not cost effective. But for us, because we have in-house expertise and our cost of water supply is so high, it was cost effective. So an IOI of one is basically, uh, like I mentioned earlier, is about 61 million gallons per year. Now back then we had 200 or 321 miles of distribution main. So again, I try, I try to keep things simple. If we do the math, that's 519 gallons per day per mile. Well, I'm an old leak detection guy. So I grew up in the field, you know, sound and pinpointing leaks. And I think of leaks as, in gallons per minute. So I just take that and convert it to gallons per minute. So it comes in at 0.36 gallons per minute per mile of main. If I can maintain that level in the distribution system, then in my simple mind, theoretically, we ought to be able to maintain around an IOI of one roughly. So here we are again with that uh, tank level change, and we talked about 99 gallons per minute. So if I walk you through the math up here, you can see that the unavoidable real loss is 60.78 million gallons per year, and converted that to 0.36 gallons per minute per mile. Well, in this DMA, back then we had 56 miles of main times that 0.36, to me, that says, well, if we could keep the leakage in that DMA at a level of 20 gallons per minute or less, we should be able to retain our ILI of, or, uh, ILI of one. Then our legitimate nighttime consumption amount, that based on that 1.5 gallons per hour per connection times number of connections would be 33 gallons per minute. So add them together, and I set a target for that Trizo Ferry DMA of 53 gallons a minute for the minimum night flow. So anytime we're above that, then we consider intervening. So obviously for this DMA, we're above it. We're at 99 gallons per minute. And the legitimate nighttime consumption of 33, that math says we've got about 66 gallons per minute running in that DMA during this minimum night flow period. Over 56 miles of Maine, that ends up being an indicator of 1.2 gallons per minute per mile, way above our targeted amount of 0.36. So we want to definitely want to be intervening. So now the way we intervene in this case, because we've got you know what, 56, 57 miles of main out there, 
is be pretty intense to do sonic leak detection, especially since it's PVC and you may miss the leaks. Um, we implement a process called step testing. So with the step testing, basically the map on the left, um, the first step you kind of figure out how to isolate um, the DMA in the two sectors. So you have a pump station, pumps off, you've got a tank, we're running off gravity on the tank, you've got flow metering at the tank, and we're going to isolate a series of valves. You know, you have to, and again, you need to put together a very detailed written plan based on your GIS and the valve locations and sequence of shutting off valves, et cetera, et cetera. Also a good idea to do some pressure monitoring when you establish these procedures to be sure you don't um, lower your, your pressures too low within the distribution system. So, and you've got your performance indicators up here in reference to the legitimate nighttime consumption calculation. So you do a step, isolate it into two areas, and do your calculations. And if you look here, then, for example, this DMA, we have procedures written to subsector it into up to eight sections. Do those various steps, various isolations of valves, and do those calculations. We're doing all this during that minimum night flow period, during that two hour period of time, we're moving through 50 some miles of distribution main. And when you implement this process, we don't ever leave a valve off for more than five minutes. So we have to make decisions very fast. So we went through this DMA, and we determined that the issue is over in this area, the southwest sector of the DMA. So I'm going to show you an actual step for this sector here. So some valves are closed, and then right here near the tank, there is an isolation valve. When we shut that valve, it stops the flow into the sector for a very short period of time, and we do those measurements. So the upper right, you see the actual flow data here. So again, that flow, two o'clock in the morning is 120 gallons a minute, okay? We come up here. Here is when we shut the valve, the isolation valve to do the step. So we isolate, stop the flow into that southwest sector of the DMA. And then that drop in flow is equal to the minimum night flow into that sector of the DMA. So if you do the calculations here, that change from here to here is 38 gallons a minute drop in flow for that step. Well, the legitimate nighttime consumption for that small sector should only be eight gallons a minute. So that math says there's 30 gallons a minute of leakage in that sector of the DMA. Again, you wanna normalize it, so take it over the 14 miles of main that's in that DMA, and we come up to 2.1 gallons per minute per mile, way above the 0.36. So as we were going through the step testing and the other sectors in that DMA, we were finding performance indicators that were around this, basically, and basically don't intervene, don't do anything in those other sectors of the DMA. It's really important that you have good communications with your field staff as uh, they're out there shutting a valve. They need to listen to that valve um, with an leak, acoustic leak detector to be sure the valve is not leaking through, be sure the valve is holding and is tight. Otherwise, your measurements can, can uh, lead you in the wrong direction sometimes. So in this case, there was noise on that valve. That valve was leaking through. Well, obviously, it's going from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. So what that means is that the actual leak rate in that sector of the DMA is greater than the, than the actual 30 gallons a minute. Well, that's good news when you're doing this because you're getting there, you're finding the area of the leak. So now I'm gonna take you out into the field in that area. So yeah, 30 gallons a minute of leakage and more likely greater. Um, they went on the fly, did some other valve isolations, isolated down as tight as they could. Between two mainline valves, sector probably ends up being about a mile of pipe. So we've gone from 50 some miles of pipe down to one mile of pipe within a uh, two to three hour period of time. So here's BJ, our, our field supervisor. He's out, he gets, gets daylight out now. So he goes out and starts sounding, listening on hydrants, mainline valves and services. 
Then on the left-hand side, you can see a, a GIS map of that area. So here's where he's listening. Up here to the left is the location of the actual leak. Of course, he doesn't know it's there when he's listening. When he's listening, he's listening 340 feet away from the leak. And it's as quiet as a mouse. Absolutely no noise on that pipe on the, any of these direct contact points. And that's a six inch PVC main. Oops, technology here. And so what he has to do is he has to come back the next day, actually have to mow the right away where the main's at, and then listen directly over top the main. So here he is listening directly over top the water main. You can see back here our truck in the background, and here's where he's listening before and couldn't hear anything, but he's ground miking every three to five feet, listening for what's called the impact and fountain sounds, which is located in the immediate area of the leak. No evidence at the surface, there's no water surfacing. So I'm gonna let you listen to what it sounds like to hear the impact and fountain sounds of an underground, of an underground leak. So if you listen closely, So that's what an underground leak sounds like. And that's only audible in the immediate area of the leak. And the only way to hear that, that noise is to listen directly over top the main. And in this case, he has a ground microphone. And you can see right below it is a metal plate with a spike on it that pushes down in the ground. That helps the sound travel up to the surface better and helps amplify it. I mean, could you imagine ground miking 56, 57 miles of distribution of Maine? Um, it'd take you forever. And if you're a few feet off the main line, you may not hear the leak. So for PVC, you've got to do DMAs so you know where to focus your efforts. We've never failed. We're 100% successful in pinpointing all the leaks that have, we've measured out through our, our DMA approach. And so here's an example of um, before and after. So you can see our night line before the blue line was running over 120 gallons a minute. Leak was repaired, we took post measurements um, and our night lines down to you know, around 50, 60 some gallons a minute. So we're back to our targeted level to maintain that DMA, that area of around one. If you look at the calculations, that leak then end, ended up measuring down to 70, at 78 gallons a minute, um, which would be 41 million gallons per year. Back okay, then, I've been there. I've been there a, million, uh, a couple of times to my ankle. Mm -hmm. So if you do the math on that, if we allow that to leak, switch me over everybody, everybody mute your phone. I can see. It. Okay, if you allow that leak to continuously run, it would have cost us over a hundred thousand dollars per year. Now I want to show you an example of what we call a, a growing leak. So this is on a very small DMA, or, or call it um, tater peeler DMA. Here's the DMA on the left-hand side, very small DMA. We have an input meter coming in from our supplier that splits it in both directions. So we're looking at our, our minimum night flow, and you can see here this is tracking, this is over a month's period of time. See, it was as tight as a drum. This DMA goes to zero at night. But then it started. Here you go, gallon per minute and continued. So this is a six inch PVC main. Leak began at about a gallon per minute, grew to 32 gallons per minute. Now during this time period, we went out and did direct contact sounding on the services and valves and hydrants and there absolutely no leak noise. 100 pounds of pressure. So it, it was not detectable by direct contact. So we actually excavated uh, on the main line outside the system input meter to measure the direction of flow. And we determined that it was flowing to the north and then did the ground miking intense listening directly over the surface to see if we could audibly hear that leak. And we did. We pinpointed that leak by ground miking. Um, the nearest direct contact point from where the actual leak was located at was a service 80 feet away. And on that service, it was not audible. 
even at 30, around 30 some gallons a minute, was not audible by direct contact, nor on the fire hydrant. That main was eight feet deep, absolutely no water surfacing, but we could hear it at the surface with a ground microphone. And when we excavated down, all the water was going straight down. That leak would run for years and years and years and years. So in that case, over a month's period of time, we lost about a half a million gallons of water, um, about $1,700, which, which is peanuts in comparison to what it would be over many years. Then as we, we get better and better at this, we, we thought, well, you know, I wonder if we could, could do some temporary DMAs and find some, some very small leakage. Um, so this is another DMA, our feel and drive DMA. And on the left-hand side, you can see we have a input meter, one of those Elster meters that's given us really good flow data coming into that DMA. Um, and our, our minimum night flow is always been up a little higher than I wanted it to be. I mean, it wasn't excessive, but something was, something was going on out there. And we've been through this DMA a number of different times by direct contact, sounding, and, you know, we'd find some small leaks here and there and repair them, but never took that night line down to where I wanted it. And even did some step testing and it kind of identified that it appears there's some leakage in this area here and did some ground liking out there over the main and just could never hear the leak. So we had a little bit of time this, this one winter and said, let's really go after this thing. So we did, we went out and we, we excavated a couple different places over the pipe, exposed the main and used the, the portable strap on unit. And as you can see here, we're getting flow of five gallons per minute. So in this case, here's the portable unit uh, on the left-hand side location, and we've got a little flow going out there, which is, okay, this is actually during the daytime. We're doing daytime step testing in a very small DMA. But the real key thing here is looking at the input meter flow. If you look here as we're getting snapshots of it, it was flowing over around 20 gallons a minute and sometimes more. This is actually in the afternoon. Well, that amount, less the five that's downstream from the portable flow meter, says that we've got you know, 15 gallons a minute running between the DMA input meter and the location of the portable meter, and there's only one service there. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. Something's going on. And we, we just, you know, prior sounding could not find it. So we said, okay, let's, let's look let's look at some equipment technology. So, you know, I, I have to remind myself that, you know, 30 years ago or 35 years ago when I first got into this, you know, we were, I was using some acoustic leak detection and the old guys were using the Globe geophones and they hated the acoustic leak detection equipment and I didn't like the Globe geophones. So, you know, sometimes I'm at that age now, I might get a little resistant to some technology, but Anyhow, I'm gonna share this with you. So here's that area. We were near a service to where the actual leak ended up being was 1,100 feet away. So we have two different types of direct contact listening equipment, and neither one would audibly hear that leak at that distance on a six inch PVC main, which is um, obviously no brainer. You're not going to hear it. But now ground miking in through that section, we use the one here, this type of equipment with a ground mic. Now, no, in the background is an interstate, and we're out here during the day ground miking. Now, he also was out there at night uh, with this type of equipment, could not audibly hear the leak when the interstate traffic was less. Then, a different type of newer type equipment, listening direct contact over the road surface, and boom, he could audibly hear the leak noise. So the equipment you use is very important, but I, I recommend, I mean, you can hear leaks with all types of equipment, but you really need to use it and compare it on some extremely difficult leaks to identify, hey, should I be using some different type of technology? What we ended up finding was a service line leak on an abandoned service, one that wasn't even on the GIS. There were no indicators there was a service in that area except for the known service that's in, in use. Um, but by listening directly over top the main, we are able to identify and find that leak. So run times of leaks. You hear lots of talks about run times. 
So here is uh, the runtime of, of that leak. The white space is the actual leakage rates. So if you look to the left-hand side, you can see that um, this is when I think we first brought on the smart technology in that DMA. So it was running probably around four gallons a minute. And then it kept growing and we would intervene and find various leaks and fix and repair, et cetera, et cetera. But never got down below that four to five gallon per minute range. Then that leak started growing some more and we were able to implement the step testing procedure I showed you. We found and repaired the leak and boom, took that DMA right down to zero, basically tighten it right up and it's still tight. So that little service line leak at an average of say a baseline of five gallons a minute, ran for over a thousand days, seven million gallons at that cost, that service line leak cost us $20,000. And if it continued to run, which it could, if we had not implemented this procedure, it would cost us $8,000 a year at five gallons a minute. Another scenario is what we called scattered leakage. And this was something we, uh, in fact, I presented part of this at NAL, the beginning part of it, but I'm gonna tell you the rest of the story. So now this is that Trizo Ferry DMA. We're up to 62 miles out there now um, as we get growth and 1500 connections. So through those step testing procedures, which I explained to you earlier, we prioritize this area one in this DMA, 2.5 gallons per minute per mile, way above our 0.36. That's 25 gallons a minute. Here's the actual step testing we did in that sector. You can see our, our flows, our drops and flows. Again, you're making decisions really fast in the field within five minutes to grab flows, calculate leakage of 25 gallons per minute. I'm gonna share this timeline with you. I, I think this is very interesting. So we did that first step test, identified that priority area on November the 21st this fall at this point in time. We went in that area, found some service leaks, and then we just went ahead and did acoustic sounding on the whole DMA, all 62 miles of Maine. We found 19 service line leaks, estimated 66 gallons a minute. We estimate, estimated based on the length and width of the crack and the pressure in that area, or if we see a change in night flows. But our night flows really kept staying relatively constant. And then we had a tornado hit. The tornado hit us. And uh, of course, when that tornado hit, destroyed some houses, busted some services, got those under control that night by morning, and the night line gets back down. Then we get a main break. You see one night line increase one night, and uh, we actually had a main break, got that repaired, brought that back down. Still, we, we can't, you know, you get this main break, you're like, oh, that's what it was, and now everything get back to normal. No, it didn't. Didn't get back to normal. So we went out and we implemented step testing a second time in that DMA. And again, that priority area one, we identified about 50 gallons a minute of, of leakage now. Wow, this is the same area. And we went out and did some additional step testing during that night period of time and had it isolated between two mainline valves. Found the cracked main, I'm gonna show you some details on that. And boom, after repairs dropped our flows down, we actually got us down below our targeted level and we're staying down there. So that crack main was definitely a contributor to our inability to drop that minimum night flow to our targeted level. So let's talk about the crack main. So here's that priority area one that we started chasing back in November and re-step tested um here in uh, april and what happened back then in november 25 gallons a minute we only found three service line leaks totaling 13 gallons a minute so we were shy something else was running in that dma um, but we can never find it by direct contact sounding we assume these are that amount of water probably a few service line leaks so we just did direct contact sounding did not listen over top the main at that point in time then the step testing here identified at about 50 gallons a minute, isolated it between these two mainline valves and the lower left side graph. That valve there stepped off, it was tight. So now we got it down to, that was probably less than a half a mile sector 
um, to try to identify where that specific leakage was at. So here's the site and um, the six inch PVC main, three foot deep under rocky soil conditions, 94 pounds of pressure on that main. Acoustic leak detection after the step testing, um, we could not hear anything on these two direct contact points and on this mainline valve, no noise at all. Down here to the left hand side, that blue dot, which represents a service, we listened on that back in December based upon our first step testing, and it was quiet, no noise at all. But from the step testing in April, identified that sector, we listened on there, we had noise. We now have leak noise on this service. In fact, by ground miking down through there, we could actually audibly hear that main line break 98 feet away, over listening directly over top of the main line. So we went ahead and, and obviously uh, pinpointed that leak. That leak was then located 23 feet west of the tap to that service. And that service there was a copper service about five foot in length. So we could hear that crack main by direct contact, basically 28 feet away. You know, it's very unusual for us under low customer density to, to be able to be that close to a main break. So typically that main break would be further away and we would not hear it by direct contact and only hear it by ground miking over the main. No evidence of water at the surface at that point. We did find later a creek down below and some discharge into the creek. Again, got the leak repaired. So you got your night line before, you got your night line after. Always do your comparisons to be sure you're finding everything out there and there's not something else running. So here's BJ again. Uh, he's out, he's sounding on that service line. That service line, he could audibly hear that leak noise. The leak was down in this direction. Excavated, and here's the leak. Now this is under reduced pressure, obviously. And uh, let's look, I think there's a little video on this. Okay, so there's the leak. And then obviously here's the repair. What's really important with DMAs is to identify these types of mainline breaks, reduce the pressure, and get them repaired under pressure. That way you're not depressurizing the system. That way you don't have to disinfect the water main. That way you don't have to take bacteriological samples. Always try to keep positive pressure on that main to reduce the risk of contamination uh, into the distribution system. Great advantage of DMAs. Now I'm gonna share just an, another example of what we're seeing in some of our DMAs. We'll finish up here shortly. So in the GIS, obviously you're tracking pressure data and your leak break frequencies and locations of those breaks. Here's a scenario where we actually had, and this is our Trizo Ferry DMA, our troublesome DMA. Um, we had our, uh, this is our discharge pressure at a pump station. The pump shuts off. Here's the pump shutting off status, shuts off. Your discharge pressure decreases. Something here happens and our pressures go way down, our tank level suddenly drops way off, our flow and the lower graph goes straight up. We've got a main break happens when that pump shut off, probably a transient. And that main break happened four and a half miles east of the pump station, about a mile east of the tank. So on the left-hand side, far to the left, you'll see the pump station, and to the middle or so, you'll see a tank. And then to the right, there's a series of main breaks right there. And that's one of them that happened. I think we had a transient on a shutoff of a pump station calls that main break. Well, you know, you hear a lot of talk about transients causing main breaks. You don't hear a lot of talk about transients causing service line breaks. So here's a case um, back in 2018 where our SCADA tags, and in this DMA, this is Chicken Road DMA, one of our operators is operating a fire hydrant, operating it improperly. And when he, when he turned it on, it pulled the tank level down to a level that calls the nearby pump to kick on to fill the tank, started causing all sorts of changes in flows, 
probably transients. We're not doing transient monitoring at this location, but it, it, it appeared that it could have damaged our system. Of course, we're back to normal fill rates and not everything seems to be okay. But what happened was within, within, uh, within days, we had two reported service line breaks in that DMA. And our night line, if you look at this back in November, when that actually happened on that fire hydrant, potentially causing a transient, again, that white space is leakage. Our night line seemed to increase uh, over a period of time. So we went ahead and did step testing in this DMA. Um, took us a bit of time to get out there to start step testing. It wasn't a high priority, but it appeared something was going on. And through the step testing, we identified some other service line leaks out there and got them repaired and reduced that minimum night flow back to our normal level. This DMA is extremely tight, typically, because you actually see a negative flow. That's because we have a little one inch bypass from another DMA that feeds this DMA uh, to keep the water fresh and it's actually filling the tank at night out there. So transients can cause damage to services also. Interesting thing, Roland uh, the other week was talking about um, performance indicators and percentages, those kind of things. This was a performance indicator in 88 that we used here with the energy program. Leak each per customer. Now, customer and services mean the same thing on our system. Uh, and we're at 73 gallons per customer, per service, per day. And we were using a performance indicator leak each per mile per day, of a little over a thousand gallons. Now, back in 2018, with the AWWA free water audit software, we're now down to 720, comparison to over a thousand, and we're down to 32 if we convert to uh, gallons per connection per day. So it was interesting to see, we actually use these performance indicators back in, in 1988 as we continue the struggle over what performance indicators to use today. We're maintaining an IOI of, of one um, throughout the total distribution system. And wanted to share the kind of the payback calculations. You know, we didn't have good input metering back in the early 2000s. So I'm running a comparison to the the actual median IOI data in the state of Tennessee. So back 2014, we're running a little bit less than one IOI, which is back then was $186,000 per year of real losses. The median IOI in Tennessee back then was a little over two. That's the median, the middle of the road. The average is much higher. So comparison to medium, if we kept ours at the medium, like other utilities in Tennessee, the real loss value would be over $450,000. That less uh, where we're at is a net benefit of 271. Capital investments to smarten up and build some DMAs, about 210,000, depreciated over 10 years, 21,000. That difference is a net benefit of 250,000 per year. We were building about 6,000 customers. So that's a net benefit of $42 per customer per year. Simple payback, probably about nine months. So very cost effective stuff to be doing. So finish out the presentation in summary. Um, I wanna tell you, be sure you're using performance indicator data to set your minimum night flow targets for each DMA. Your DMAs um, will identify areas for emergency main breaks faster. Step testing quantifies and identifies leakage in sectors. The direct contact acoustic leak detection without listening at the surface can miss mainline breaks on PVC pipe. And you always wanna do your minimum night flow analysis before and after repairs. And pressure transients can cause damage to mains and services. That finishes my presentation and uh, be glad to turn it back over to Melania and for any questions and answers. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, Chris. That was great. You can stop you can stop sharing your screen right now. So everybody can look at you. Oh no. Okay. <laughs>
Yes. Ah, here we go. Perfect. We already have a question here from Jan Rogers. Uh, have you seen the chat already or would you like me to read this for you? For legitimate uh, night consumption, were any meters read between 1.30 and 3.30 a.m.? I took this approach in Oman when I was creating and baselining the country while the DMEs. So that, that, is a good, that is a good approach. You can read the meters before and after um, to do that. Um, we do not. We just use that factor of 1.5 and really going to wait till we migrate to AMI to be able to pull AMI data in and, and integrate it. Yes, that's a good way to do it. Read before and after. If you got the manpower available to do that, we only have 15 total employees, so uh, we, we, we don't do that. But that can be helpful, yes. If you have any, I also want to say, if you have any excessive night users out there, you definitely have to read them. So most of our system is residential. Okay, very interesting, Chris. What is the relationship of leaks which come to the surface and those you have to hunt down? Julian Tartan is asking. So uh, I'll jump all the way back to the energy program when I was on the consultancy side for the Tennessee Energy and Water Conservation Program. Back, back then, 75% of the leaks that were identified in that energy program were not surfacing. Um, the ones here at the utility, um, the vast majority of the leaks do not surface. The, um, uh, we found many, of, many, main, many main breaks um, that have no evidence at, at the surface. And we're in a relatively karst environment, so a lot of the leaks go down. Um, so, you know, when a utility manager says we fix all our leaks, um they fix all the leaks that surface that means there's a whole lot more out there they haven't gotten to perfect Ian rogers asking again have you tried hydrophones uh, which use the water to convert the leak noise these can be more effective than noise loggers especially on pl plastic pipes yes so um when we evaluated the equipment on that one leak uh, during that during that week, we evaluated the hydrophone technology with the correlators, and we actually had a leak in a different DMA that had been repaired. Uh, we excavated and took the repair clamp off to re-simulate the actual main break. That main break was only detectable by ground miking, not by direct contact. We used um, the uh, correlators and the, the hydrophones and bracketed in. And we had to come into like within uh, the two services that were maybe off the top of my head, you know, 150 feet apart. And yes, then we could hear the leak. But once we widened that bracket, it wasn't detectable with hydrophones. So we have experimented with them and, and we have not seen the success. I, I think there is tech, not, they do work definitely. And I think anytime you do the DMA step testing and identify that area, yes, hydrophones would be the tool to use to help pinpoint the leak. Okay, we still have a few minutes now. How long it takes to how long it takes to plan step testing for DMAs and adverse impact, for example, on water water quality or decoloration? So. Um, the plan to do the DMAs, I, I guess, you know, since we're a small utility, I, I, I can't focus a whole lot of energy on, on water loss control. But a number of years ago, when the economy kind of crashed here in the States, we had to look at really efficiencies. And that's when I got into establishing DMAs full bore. Um, pull your GIS data, you know, write your plans. Um, if you've got somebody good in GIS to draw the maps up for you, that's really helpful. I'm not too good in GIS, but I can, I can lump along and enough to do what I need to do. Um, and then as, as far as the water quality, um, a lot of ours were natural DMAs. Um, a lot of times in those DMAs, we may have a little bypass, like a three quarter inch bypass into other DMAs to flow water around to keep the water quality up. If they're dead ends, we just put them in our flushing program to flush. Uh, I think to me, 
um, the, the recovering, the, the value of our, our water loss is extremely, extremely important and much more valuable than the cost to, to do some flushing to keep the water quality um, the best we can. Okay, are you looking to deploy more pressure transient loggers to monitor transients as well as providing an acoustic de detection methodology? Frank van der Kiel is asking. So, um, yes, we've been selected as one of the four pilot one utilities uh, in a world in the, for the Water Research Foundation project. Uh, where we're going to be monitoring pressure transients and the relationship uh, to main breaks to reduce water loss. Uh, there's us, a utility in California, and two from Australia. So uh, here in the middle, toward the end of May, we're going to deploy um, six uh, transient um, uh, monitors, uh, working with uh, Xylem, Vicente, and, and their group. Uh, in that research project, in that Trizel Ferry DMA. So we're going to be able to identify um, if we do truly have transients out there. I mean, I've logged some, you know, four times per second and identified maybe we do, but I got to get the pros in to, to figure all this out. And as far as acoustic logging, um, um, probably not going to move that path yet. After we get AMI implemented, I'm, I'm very interested in, in identifying areas of leakage on, with pressure. I think that, that can give us some pretty good insight where some things are happening, but I've got to make my system a lot smarter moving in that direction. Yeah, I think that is it. Is there a last question here? Were you sure about the legitimate night consumption value? I think you already, you already explained that. But yeah. if you have anything else to comment. I think um, that is it. Thank you very much, Chris. We are reaching our time now. Thank you. If you want to say something and bye everybody. Yeah, I, sure. I, I uh, really appreciate everybody sitting in and listening. And, and uh, if you ever get to the States, and of course it won't happen anytime soon, obviously, but if you get over here and want to stop by in our system and, and put some hands on the stuff, we'll take you out and do some minimum night flow measurements. And Julian, thank you for the invite to participate. Julian and I did a lot of work many, many years ago together. And, uh, You're and very well, uh, Chris. It's come see us. <laughs> okay. it, was, it was really nice to watch that actually because it just took me right back to uh, the work we did uh, oh my uh, almost 30 years ago now right so <laughs> it was uh, it was a lot of fun a lot of yeah. fun thanks very much chris for that and i think uh, i think you're going to get a lot of hits on uh, youtube with that as well as people yeah, as people start to find it and uh, you know uh, and go through that so uh, thanks a lot and uh, i guess we're at our time right melanie yeah it's yeah. time right okay. now thank you Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Bye.